for the last, oh, four or five years, I've been um, restoring the, the windows and the sash that are in the Mead building, um, which is a, a building that's on the HSC, the Human Services Center, the State Hospital um, campus. Um, and it's a, it's a big, grand building um, with, uh, there's a, a arched windows and, and a whole mess of, of rectangular windows. I think there's 230 some odd windows in the, in the place. Um, and from that, I, I, I have done some, oh, I was just kind of documenting the work that I did on Instagram. And then from that documentation, um, was contacted by a, a magazine called Fine Home Building. And that's what the, the article is, is from. But we did that actually at my house, um, just to try to get a more relatable and a more um, residential size. You know, the, the, the windows out at the Mead Building are, are neat, um, but they're huge. You know, they're five feet wide, nine feet high, big arch tops. They're not necessarily relatable. So we wanted to do an article on the, um, Oh, on restoring the windows in the building. But to begin with, I, I brought a video. Um, I know probably most of you don't necessarily know the Mead building or um, me saying they're big and round. It doesn't really help. So I brought a video that shows, um, oh, some of the work that we did. I just pulled these off of my phone. Um, I don't know, it's memories or whatever, where you can just do like a video slide presentation. So um, this is about a, about a four and a half minute long video and it'll give you an idea of some of the work that we did.
All right, well, um, as you can notice, there's a lot of, a lot of finger pointing um, in the video, and I apologize. I, I take a lot of the videos myself, and I'm in the videos, I'm kind of explaining what it is that I'm, what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, so apologize for the, for the finger pointing. Um, and also, in, in that video, it shows, a, it shows me doing a lot of rebuilding those sash. The arch tops that were in that building were, were, were not made all that well to begin with. Um, they lasted 100 years. So, I mean, that's a, a relative thing. They lasted 100 years. Um, but they didn't have joinery where the, where, uh, on the arched pieces. They were toenailed with, with nails. Um, and from that, the wind had blown and they had rotted out and they had been repaired and replaced and, and cobbled together. They had plywood over them. There just wasn't anything that I could save of those sash. So we tried to replicate them um, to look exactly like they did before, but um, make them with, with the joinery um, so that they'll last uh, a, a, decent, a decent amount of time and hopefully um, hold up to the wind. Also, we made storm sash that are on the exterior. So all that whole building now has um, storm sash on it, uh, which it didn't have to begin with. It's a, it's a different time and it's, it's a different use. Um, when that building was first built, it was, um, it was part of the campus and then you had the tunnel system. It all went to a power plant. Um, you know, there's a coal-fired power plant. They had a rail spur that came there. They had an infinite amount of heat um, that came via the, via the tunnels um, to heat the place. So they weren't as concerned with energy efficiency. Um, but now they're, they're changing it into the Dakota Territory Museum. So it's a, it's a real concern, um, both heating and cooling and climate control. So you're not having big um, changes in humidity levels. So they wanted to, they wanted to restore the windows that were there, um, but have the energy efficiency or try to have the energy efficiency. So that's where we ended up putting the, the storm sash on the outside. So we had to make make storm sash for all of them, but the, the, the majority of the windows in the building, we restored. Um, we didn't, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't just throw them out and make, and make new ones. We tried to save everything that we could. And it's one of the, one of the um, beauties of traditional sash making, like the way that the windows were made to begin with, they're not, they're not glued together. They're, they're through mortise and tenon joinery, and then they have a, um, what's called a sash pin, which is basically a, head, a headless nail that's driven in. There's one on the top, there's two on the bottom. They're driven into that tenon, so they, so they peg the, the tenon. Well, by doing that, you can, when you scrape the paint off of those, and we can get into that later here, um, talking about steam box and getting the glazing off and getting the glass out and all that business. Um, but by driving that, by, by scraping the paint off, you can see the little white um, spot where the nails are. And then you can drive those nails out uh, with a, um, oh, a straight, a straight sided um, punch. You know, not a tapered punch, but a, a straight sided, or an eighth inch or what have you. And you can drive those pins down till they poke out the bottom. Usually you put a two by four down. You set those on top, you drive them down into the two by four until the two by four kind of sticks. Then you pop the two by four off, and then you can grab with a pair of vice grips that pin and pull it out. And when you do that, now you can take that joint apart. Um, and then you can just replace the pieces that need to be replaced or do repairs. Um, usually, well, almost always, it's the low horizontal of either the upper sash or the lower sash. There, that's what's rotted. The water comes down, the glazing's off, it sits on that ledge, it starts to eat a hole, and then just more water goes in, more water goes in, and it, eventually it rots out that, that lower horizontal, that r lower rail. And if it gets real bad, it'll rot out the bottom of the styles too. Um, and in that case, then the only thing you've got to save is that top piece. But usually you can just replace the bottom um, rail on the windows, either the upper or lower sash. So in the video, it looks like I'm making a bunch of windows, that's just because that's the videos that I had on my phone from the last, you know, two years, um, which is what we spent. We spent a lot of time on, on those, and then also that was 
some of the stuff that was a little more interesting to do, um, a little bit more interesting to show than just the, the rectangular ones. But we did do a lot of repair um, to the original. Uh, tried to save everything we could. It, it's a it's a museum, um, but the building has the building sat vacant, I think, since 1981. Um, so you can imagine what kind of condition things were in, and just because it's sat vacant since 81, they they took it offline years before that. You know, if, how municipal buildings, how that works. They're not going to put money into something that they know they're going to not use any longer. Um, so, and, and sometimes it becomes this um, uh, clandestine destiny where, you know, you kind of prove that you need a new building by letting the building go to, go to heck. So, um, but uh, that being said, so that's what I, that's kind of what I worked on, but I thought something to be more relatable would be like residential windows. Those windows are, you know, the windows on the Me building are huge. Um, so we, for the article, we decided that we'd try to do um, some residential ones. It, it, it's more relatable. Um, and so we did them, we actually did them on my house. Uh, we've got a, like a 1920s um, bungalow um, home. So I uh, thought that it would be a good way to, to show I had access to it so we could, we could show. So that's, the, that's what the handout is. Um, and so I'll just kind of, I'll kind of go through the, the article here. Um, and we can, we can talk about a few things and then hopefully that video, you know, if you have questions, we'll, we'll certainly do those at the end, um, about the bead building or, or anything that comes up about the article. But, um, to begin with, let's see if I, if I can figure out how to make this thing work. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm just doing glazing on this. This is just the, um, oh, just a pretty picture more than anything. Uh, to begin with, I mean, the, the, the first part with window restoration is figuring out how to get the windows out. Um, and that, it's, it's a pretty basic, it's pretty easy to do, but it's not, there's a, there's a number of tricks um, that go along with it that make it a lot easier. If you just go there and try to take the window out, a lot of times things kind of get broken up. Um, but there's somewhat of a, somewhat of a method to it. Um, see if I can get this laser pointer to work. That, um, that first image I'm showing taking off the interior stop. That, that's, the, that's the piece, it's, it's held on by nails, um, showing a trick there where you're using two, basically two pry bars so that you're not marring things up. Um, pulling that, uh, you know, prying that open. First thing that you need to do is usually score with a um, with a putty, or not a putty knife, a utility knife, um, the paint, so when you, so you can get a clean separation, so you're not yanking paint off of, off of one side or another. You need to get that, um, that interior stop off so that you can get the lower sash, which is, you know, that one right there, so you can get that one out. Um, that's all you have to do to get that one out. You pull those, um, the interior stop, pull that off, and then you can get, get the window out. There's ropes that hang down um, that are attached to weights that are inside a, um, that are inside the elevator boxes that are on either side. Um, there's just a knot, there's a hole drilled in the side. You can just pull the knot and it'll just come, come loose and then leave the ropes hang in place. Um, also with these, uh, with those interior stops, uh, it's also good to um, label them as you take them apart. <laughs> Um, here you can see I'm, I, I'm taking that, that rope out um, there. Uh, there's, a, there's a channel along the side. There's a, there's a drilled hole that the knot goes in, and the, uh, the channel is what the, uh, the rope um, uh, tracks on when it's, when it's in its, uh, I don't know what the heck that's called. This, you know, you've got the, you've got the pulley there, and then this race area where the, um, where the lower sash can move up and down. Um, the upper sash, this is the one that's kind of the, the one that causes problems. This, this lower sash, that's pretty easy and straightforward to get out. The upper one um, is, is a challenge. And usually they're painted shut, almost always they're painted shut. They're, they're, they're supposed to be able to move, they're, they're supposed to be able to come down. You're supposed to be able to move the lower one up and the top one down. That's, what, that's where you hear the term double hung. 
Um, and, and it's actually a, a really efficient way to do it. If you can pull the top down and the bottom up and you can get airflow, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get a circular airflow. Um, you know, from hot air rising, you know, warmer air is on top, cooler air is on the bottom. Um, but it, it does help to, to be able to do that. Uh, we just, you don't see that as much anymore. Now it's just always the, the bottom window comes up. The, the upper sash, um, like I said, that one's always painted shut. So one of the tricks that we came up with, and uh, man, this is, this is a, a really good trick uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> these, these clamps, um, you, can, you can get them. They're, uh, they're made by Irwin. Now you can also get them from DeWalt. Uh, they're, they're, a heavy, they're the heavy duty version of uh, quick clamps. Okay, but they can be reversed, so they can be flipped over. So what, what you end up doing is you end up putting the top of those against the top of the, um, of the casement, and then the two of them as close to the, um, as close to the outer edge on the, on the lower rail as you can get. You don't want to put it in the middle because then you'll bow that rail. You want to try to get it all the way out. You got to be a little careful because on most residential windows, that joint right there is usually just a, a bridle joint. So really, the only thing that is holding those is um, are those sash pins. So you, you want to be kind of careful, and you do want to score on the outside and on the inside with a utility knife. But um, if you if you score on the inside and the outside, usually. Um, you can pump those clamps so you're squeezing them and they're just gonna they're gonna pop that thing loose um, which is um, which is why I'm why I'm kind of kind of proud of it because it um, it works really well and it's pretty gentle and it's a lot better than going in there with a with a um, with a hammer and a block and smacking those things down which is kind of the the standard way of of doing that but yeah the, these clamps really really uh, that works great. Once you get it loose, now it's a matter of driving that thing all the way down to the bottom. And the reason that you've got to drive it all the way down to the bottom is because you need to get what's called the parting stop. That's the wooden piece that's between um, that's between the two windows. There's let's see, it's right it's right there. Pardon my shake. Um, it's a it's a half inch wide piece by about by about three quarter, and it sits into into the the parting stop groove, um, and it's just pushed in there. It's there, it's not mechanically fastened. It's just a pressure fit, um, and usually you can grab a hold of that with a pair of duckbill um, vice grips. You can grab onto that and and pull it and to get it out. But you have to get that upper sash all the way down to the bottom of, of the of the casement. So you can pull it out and then lift it up. If that, I don't know if any of that makes sense or not, but that window has to get all the way down because at the at the um, at the meeting rail or the check rail, this it doesn't really show up in these um, necessarily in this drawing, but that piece has an angle on it so that those two, so the lower rail and the or excuse me, the, the lower sash and the upper sash, so they come together, um, they're gonna come together like this. And then you got the sash lock that squeezes it, okay? Well that piece, this one, on the, on the upper sash, that gets in the way, because by having these two pieces at an angle, they take up the space that's between the two windows. You can't have the two windows right on top of each other. There's a half inch space between there. Um, and that takes up takes it up the the lower sash it just comes out because it's not trapped by anything but that parting stop um, you can't get that thing out because of that because of that check rail so that's why you have to get it all the way down to the bottom and then pull it out so you're gonna have to bend it and pull it out um, and I think I'm kind of showing that here I think if I remember right um, but yeah, that's like I said. Half the battle is just getting the just getting the sash out to begin with. 
Um, we'll go on to the next page. Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is the center of the magazine, so it's a, a um, so the, the photo looks a little odd. This is a, um, a makeshift steam box, all right? Um, so it's basically uh, foil-faced insulation with a, um, with a wooden framework around it. Um, there's a door that's hinged. I've got some conduit, uh, metal conduit in there. There's some copper that the, that the sash sits on. Um, I'll show, at the end here, we'll show a video of, of what it does, um, you know, as it comes out. Mainly what, what I'm doing with it is, oh, and I, I guess I should explain it a little bit more. Um, the, the sash are going to go in, into that, and the door gets closed, and then I heat it with a, um, with a turkey fryer and a red gas can that does not have gasoline in it. Um, and it was a new gas can. It started off. That, that's basically a tea kettle. So we fill that up with water, and I've got a radiator hose run to it, and there's tubing in the back, and that's going to release steam. It's fired by that propane tank right there, and it's going to, um, once the door gets closed, the window goes in, it's going to heat that sash up to, you know, 200 degrees boiling, boiling point for the most part, and it's going to loosen all of the glazing. That's what I'm after. That glazing is, is, is rock hard, um, and you can't get that stuff out really any other way unless it's just so badly crumbled that it, you, you know, it just falls out. Um, but by heating it for about 45 minutes, it just softens it right up and it comes right out. The other thing that it does is that it heats the whole sash. Um, it, it, it heats it all up evenly which is important for the glass itself. Because if, if you use a heat gun, so you, you, know, you can maybe heat the, the glazing and possibly remove it with a heat gun, but what happens is that you thermally shock the glass. You end up heating it, a, a, like a corner usually is the susceptible one. You heat the corner of the glass, there's that slight expansion from heating and it breaks it. So, by using the steam box, it brings the glass, all the glass up evenly in temperature, and, and then when you take it out, it all goes down evenly in temperature. And that then preserves that glass um, for, and that's, that's advantageous for a number of reasons. One, it's, it's um, you don't have to buy any more glass. You can reuse the stuff that you've got. Um, so there's a, uh, an economic efficiency to it. But then also, it's, his, it's the historic glass, so it's, it has these imperfections in it. Um, it. There's a wave to it, there's air bubbles, um, there's just different things that as you look out the window, you don't necessarily pick up on it. You don't necessarily know, oh, that's old glass or what have you, but for some reason it looks right. You know, if, you, if, you have a, you know, if you're looking for it, it's easy to spot. But you know, just you know, just in your house or um, at some um, some older home, um, it just for some reason it just looks right. And what it is is it's it's the distortion. You'll see, you know, it'll it won't be like crazy funhouse, you know, um, distortion. But it will be. It'll just it, it has a wave to it. And um, I think at the end of that the end of that video. Um, of the um, of the Mead building, I was showing that in in the center arch. Um, w I rebuilt those windows, but we used the glass from the building. Um, we tried to we tried to use the the um, antique glass. So that's another advantage of the of the steam box. So it one it's it's getting the glazing soft. Um, two, we're able to reuse the glass, and three, it bubbles all the paint up. Don't necessarily go after the paint at that time because it's 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 wet and the wood fibers are easily um, frayed. So uh, we usually let that dry for a day and then we'll go back in and scrape that. Um, and scraping paint, it's, it's lead paint. It, it, it almost always is lead paint. Um, if you're doing this for yourself, um, you, can, you can do it no problem. I mean, if it's your own home, um, you can basically kind of do what you want. Um, if you're hiring contractors to do this, um, uh, you, they should be RRP, I think that's what it is. Um, RRP, uh, removal, restoration, and paint. Uh, lead compliance. 
um, and playing along with those, with those rules. Um, that was an, another reason for us doing this article of me doing it at our house, is that by doing it at my house, we didn't necessarily have to do the full thing on leg compliance. Otherwise, that, that, that's all the article would be, would be about, would be leg compliance. Um, so uh, that was an, another reason for doing it at our house. We, we, we still tried to follow, you know, it's good practice to follow those regulations. Um, but um, there, it's, it's different from a contracting point of view. And then, you know, if you have children involved and, um, yeah, I think it, that could be a whole other, whole other topic. We'll just stick to the, to the restoration. So that's the steam box. Um, there's the, let's see, that's the, the rest of the um, images. Here you can see the glazing. Um, removing that, uh, cleaning glass, um, and here, here it's scraping down, scraping down paint. So you can see, um, we we tried to do um, a number of things. One, one we're outside. Um, we've got a, I've got a, 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 um, a plastic area underneath. There's a two by four framework underneath um, where I'm working. Uh, Tyvek suit. Um, um, let's see, what, what the heck is that called? A NIOSH 100? I think that's right. Uh, 100 mask. That's the, the mask that's for lead compliance. Um, and, and then I think down here at the bottom, we're talking a little bit about, um, about epoxy repair. So there's weather checking. I'm digging those weather checks out. Um, and we're going to use a product called, it's made by Abitron. It's um, uh, liquid wood and wood epox. They're kind of the industry standards as far as, as, far as um, epoxy work to fix minor repairs. Um, not, not like, it's not the best practice to like do a whole corner in this stuff, but you know, for weather checking and that kind of thing, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to, um, to, f to fix minor, minor problems. Um, let's see, yeah, here's uh, the liquid wood is going on. It's it basically, both of these, this is the, this is the product right here, um, Abitron liquid wood and wood epox. Um, basically the liquid wood is the liquid and that's gonna penetrate in, into the wood. So basically think of that as the adhesive, okay? And then wood epox, is, it's also a two part, both of these are two part products. Um, you know, you're gonna mix them beforehand and then put them, put them on, they're, they're, they're epoxies. Um, but the, the wood epox is, is a putty. Um, and it's a, kind of a lightweight putty. And that is what fills. Um, so usually you're putting that on with, um, oh, like a, like a putty knife, um, trying to push it into those, into those voids. So the, the liquid is the adhesive that, that glues the putty to the wood. I don't know if that totally makes sense, but that's, that's the way the, way the product wo works. Um, once it cures out for, you know, it's usually a, the next day, then you can go in and you can sand and smooth, smooth everything um, and paint and do whatever you need to do. Um, and there I'm sanding there. Um, another thing, these scrapers, they're made by Baco, which is a, a, a Swedish company, and they are the, they're the best scrapers out there. They just, they work fantastic. The carbide on those um, they come in different in different sizes. They, this handle right here only comes with a triangle, and then you have to buy these things separately. But they don't come with the handle, so you know you can either you know you can buy these individually, or I end up buying um, a number of these with the triangle, and then and then just end up putting those on. So I've got a, a little arsenal of them, um, and then just a, a two-inch scraper. Again, um, they're they're carbide, but there's differences between in carbides, and these are fantastic. Basically, it's the um, the granules, the granulars, granule, uh, small particles that um, make up the uh, the the carbide. The smaller the particle is, the better the carbide's going to be. Because if they're made up of kind of larger chunks, those larger chunks are nice and hard, but when they break off, they they dull quickly. And these um, they they just do a fantastic job. Um, I don't know if you can get them anywhere. 
I, I always get them. I, I, I end up. I, I get them on. I get them on Amazon, or you can get them from some of the woodworking magazines, Lee Valley, or Hartville Tool, or whatever. Um, but I haven't been able to find, at least down in Yankton, I haven't been able to find a, a local source. Um, but yeah, it's. I guess one of the things that Amazon is 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 good for. Um, all right. Now we're now we've got the. Um, the sash is, 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 been, is out, it's been through the box, um, the steam box. It's been repaired, scraped, sanded, um, and, and here it's painted with, um, with oil-based primer. Uh, usually you're gonna use an oil-based primer. You can top coat with anything. You can top coat with latex, you can top coat with oil-based, you can top coat with uh, linseed oil all back, um, you know, uh, paint that's um, it's, you know, if you want to get really, really historically accurate, you can do a, a linseed oil paint. Um, but um, to begin with, a an oil-based primer um, seems to seems to work the best. Uh, be, basically, because you can you can then top coat it with anything. If you go with a, a latex-based primer, you're you're going to be doing latex from from then on. The the, the rule is is um, everything can let's see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you can go with latex over oil, but you can't go with oil over over latex. Um, so here we've got it's all primed, um, sanded up, and we're putting putting glass back in. Um, I've put a bed of glazing compound um, in this piece, and then dropping the glass in. There's something uh, it shows up here. Um, and all right, the, the glazing compound is um, the stuff that I use is from Sarco. Um, it's uh, it, it comes in two different kinds. It's made in Chicago. Um, it's either Type M, which is stuff that can cure if you're going to have the windows and they're going to cure inside. Um, like so, they've got to they've got to sit and kind of skin over before you can paint them. Um, the Type M has some dryers in it that will cause it to skin over a little bit quicker and allow you if you're going to have them sit inside to kind of dry, but the dryers will cause problems if you set them outside to dry. Like if you, if you glaze the windows and then put them back in, um, the dryers can cause cracking because it, it, it wants to dry that glazing a little bit too quick. Um, so if that's the case, then you would use uh, dual glaze. I think that's, yeah, type M and dual glaze. And uh, dual glaze is, is just regular old glazing compound and all glazing compound is all it is is it's um, it's chalk and linseed oil I mean that's basically basically the two the two things um, and uh, and the and whiting is chalk uh, a calcium carbonate is what is what whiting is and that's chalk so um, we I, I don't use I don't necessarily use whiting we use whiting it helps to clean off the glass and, and that kind of thing and add to the uh, to the linseed or, or add to the um, glazing compound if it's a little bit if it's a little sticky um, you can add that to it to um, to make it more um, oh it, it's like making bread you don't you don't want it necessarily to come off on your hands um, but you want it to be good and, and malleable um, so you can add chalk to it um, that's what like I said, that's what whiting is, but I don't necessarily use whiting. I use athletic field marker. You can get it from the hardware store, um, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. You can get a big bag of it for 20 bucks, where you can get a you know a small, a, a, a small little pint-sized container of whiting for about 20 bucks. Um, but they're basically the same thing. Um, setting, whoop, pardon me. Uh, set, setting glass in here, um, and like I said, it's in a bed. So there's a, on the glazing rabbit. Uh, which is a little wooden ledge that the glass sits on. Um, I've put glazing compound on there. Um, and on these small windows, it's easy enough to do it by hand. You just, you just pack that, um, um, pack the, the glazing rabbit um, just by pushing the, uh, the, the um, glazing compound on it. Uh, in the video before, I think you maybe saw where I was using a, an electric or a cordless caulk gun. Um, and that's what we were doing on that. It's just basically to, to bed the glass. That way it's sealed on the inside. It takes up any imperfections of the glazing rabbit and it stops the glass from, from rattling um, uh, once, you, once you glaze it. 
So that gets set on, and then there's a, a real good trick here of using a, um, a sander. So like a quarter sheet, you know, just a, not a dual action, not a disc that's, that, that spins, but just a, the old fashioned um, electric sander that is like a, a third sheet or a quarter sheet. It doesn't have any sandpaper on it. It has a uh, piece of flannel shirt wrapped around it. And basically we're, that's just being used as a, um, to vibrate the glass and smoosh the glazing compound down. You just want a real thin layer um, on the bottom side. So that just vibrates and, and purges out the, the excess material. And then um, a glazing point gun, uh, that's, a, that's a vintage uh, one. Those are, those are the best ones. Um, if you have a bunch of sash to do, that's a great thing to invest in. If you don't have a bunch of sash to do, it's probably not worth it. Um, you can just get the glazing points and you can push them in with, um, uh, oh, with, a, with a putty knife, what have you. And what, and what the glazing points do, they're basically like little diamonds and they get pushed into the wood. And the, the reason for those is that's what, that's what keeps the glass in. Those glazing points go in. You've got the, the, the glazing compound and that, the glazing compound is to weather tight it. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't have adhesive qualities to it. It'll stick, it'll stick you know, to the window in that and, and stick um, good enough to stay there, but it won't necessarily hold the window in. So you need to have the glazing point so that you know, the sash won't, won't fall out, um, if, that, if that makes sense. And the glazing is on the, is on the outside of the window. Um, and then on here, we're just going through the, uh, a couple of different steps of, of glazing, a couple of tricks. I've got a, a video or two here at the, at the end. One of them shows a little bit of glazing. Um, and I think that's, I think that's it for, for that article. Um, once the glazing's on, uh, they're going to sit for, um, Sarko recommends two weeks. That, that always seems too long to me. I basically go until, until I feel comfortable where I can top coat them with paint. Um, and usually two coats of, of um, uh, either an exterior latex or an exterior um, oil, depending on you know what it is that you want want to use. Um, and then and then reinstalling, and you just basically you do things in reverse. You put the upper sash in, you put the parting the parting stops in, you put the lower sash in, and then you put the interior stop. Um, and that's basically the the sash restoration. Um, and then. You can also add a, a storm window. Um, I've, I've, got a, I've got another article that I'm supposed to do. Um, they're supposed to come back out sometime this summer, and we're supposed to do that if I can find some time to, to do that. And, and, and those are, you know, that basically there's a, uh, on, the, on the outside of your window, there's a, there's a brick mold on, his, on traditional windows. That brick mold is one and an eighth inch thick, and that's how thick your storm sash are. And they're just basically a, a full sheet of um, usually um, you've got a, a top rail, bottom rail, the two styles, and then the mid rail matches the um, matches the check rail that's on your that's on your sash. Um, so that's one, one of the nice things about being able to do like like custom storm windows is that you can you can make them everything line up. Um, otherwise, you know if you're doing the um, the storm store-bought windows or the aluminums or what have you, you're kind of stuck with where the manufacturer um, makes them. So, but I thought um, this article had a couple of, there's a couple of videos that went along with it that they, that they shot at the same time. Um, and we'll, I, I think we'll show those next. It'll show the steam box. It'll show, um, oh, it'll also show how I, how I, how I close those windows out. When you take the sash out, you got to put something in. Um, so it, it shows uh, the way that we plywood those up, um, and I can try to explain that a little bit after the after the video. But at least it'll give you give you a reference. So let's start with um, I don't know if if that one that with the enclosing does that I don't know how they're labeled. I'm sorry. The sash repair can take a few weeks to complete mostly because there's a lot of waiting for primer, glazing, and paint to dry. In the meantime, you'll need to close the window opening to protect the house from the weather. 
In this video, Ben Brunick shows us his method, which starts with OSB strips inserted into the parting bead dado. The beauty of the system is how secure it is without driving any screws into the window frame. I wanted to show how, how we close windows up um, without like, putting any screws or anything into the opening. And the way that that's done is there's, when we took the sash, the upper and lower sash out, we took the, the parting stop out. And the parting stop has got a, a half inch um, groove uh, here. And this is 7 16 inch um, OSB. And it's going to fit right, right into that groove. And by having, a, having a, a small piece on this side and then a small piece here on the other side, um, those are tied into the groove. And then, we, and then we've got a piece of plywood um, here that will close up the um, We'll close up the, the opening, and we're going to run screws here, four, four points. And by tying that together, it'll be, you know, it'll be tied in here and tied in here, and it won't, it won't come out. Um, I've pre-drilled pre these, these um, holes so that when you put the screw in, you know, you're not going to end up bridging. It's going to suck this, suck that piece to this piece. Um, and we'll, we'll put that in. And then, so that you're not, you don't push this piece out, you just use a little, a little wonder bar and you can hook, you know, you can hook that piece of, that, that piece that's in the, in the groove and, and back it up and then that'll allow you to, that, that allows that screw to then catch the, catch the OSB. Now you're secured, and I can work on the outside and do all the scraping, and it's not going to blow me in. And then overnight, you know, we're we're fine. All right, so that that just is a way that you can secure those windows. If you have storms on the outside, you don't have to do that. You can just leave the storms on. Um, but by having that plywood on, it it does allow you to then scrape and paint the exterior without having to take the thing you know, take your storm off, put it back on. It's just, you've got four screws, you take it out, you put it on. Um, and it, it, it's just a nice way to, to secure everything. It does make, you know, it does make the room dark and, and um, you know, neighbors might not necessarily like having OSB for long periods of time. But um, it, 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 is a, it, it does work really well, that system works great. So this next video is going to be the, the steam box. Um, and it'll show how the glazing, um, how that works and give an explanation. First step to restoring a window sash is removing the old glazing putty so you can take the glass out of the sash. In this video, Ben Burnick shows us how he uses a homemade steam box to soften the putty, which allows him to more easily remove the glass without breaking it. I want to put, put them in so that the glass is up. Um, so, you know, you don't want to put them in this way because if for some reason the glazing were to let loose and there weren't points, the glass would fall out. So glass up and then just, just slide them into place, the two of them. And we'll close it up. And we'll let them cook for, once the, once the steam starts generating, we'll let them cook for, well, 45 minutes, an hour. Stand back when first opening the door and let the steam clear. Wear gloves with thermal protection, like Ben's Thermofit gloves from Atlas. Quickly move the sash to a flat work surface. Use a putty knife to scrape away the old glazing. Before attempting to remove the glass, look around and make sure all the glazing points are out of the sash. If the putty knife didn't get them out, use a screwdriver or pliers pry or pull them. Lift the glass from underneath and carefully set it aside. Continue to remove all the glazing from the sash, but let the sash dry for about 24 hours before beginning to scrape paint. The steam box will soften the paint, but it also moisturizes the wood, which makes it more susceptible to damage from the scraping tools.
All right, well, in that I say the glass, glass up, and I should have said the glazing, the glazing side up. Um, like I said, there's a little wooden, uh, there's a little uh, wood rabbit that the glass sits on, and you want that to be on the bottom side. Um, that, I'm sure that probably makes more sense than saying glass up. So um, I think we've got, is there one more? Here, one more video here. In this video, Ben Burnick shows us how to apply glazing putty as the final step of restoring the window sash for his 1920s bungalow. You may be surprised how simple the work is. One of Ben's best tips, know when to stop. Now we're doing the actual glazing and I'm going to show running this and then and then doing this corner. The corners are kind of the kind of the tricky spot. To begin with, I'm just going to pack this and kind of set up what what it is that uh, that I want to have want to want to have it looking like at the end. It's going to be smooth, but I'm trying to get it set up um, as well as I can to its to its final um, shape. So we'll just pack this in to begin with. Tool the glazing from the top of the glazing dado to pitch away from the glass. If you go higher than the top of the dado, the glazing will be visible from inside the house. If you are too far below the top of the dado, there won't be adequate pitch. So now I'll come back here and I'll set up, I'll put some, I'll put some putty on, on that side of the blade. So now I'll come over to this. The corners are kind of the tricky part. Um, again, get a little bit on, oh, it's gonna be on that side of the blade. And I'm gonna pack that in. And then you want to 45 the corners. Oh, I'm making a mess here. Though the glazing technique doesn't change, it's important to work in this specific order. Place the sash upside down and glaze the top of each pane first. Turn the sash sideways to glaze both sides of each pane. Finally, turn the sash right side up and glaze the bottom of each pane. Allow the glazing to set up for about two weeks before painting and wax the sides of the sash before reinstalling them. All right, so what, what he's talking about there with, with like the top side and the side and the bottom is when you, I, I like to glaze right, right here instead of trying to do this and trying to do this and trying to do the the um, the top, um, I like to just do this and then rotate the rotate the window. Um, but by doing that, like I said, the the glazing doesn't necessarily have much for adhesive qualities. So if that glass is a little loose in the opening, you want to start with the window basically upside down, do do the what, what would be the top, and then turn it and do the sides, and then have it flipped up the the correct direction that it's gonna sit in the window and do the bottom. That's gonna, what that does is if that, sat, if that window is going to move at all, it's not gonna mess up the glazing that you, know, that you spent time trying to tool. Um, and then once it's glazed, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna need to, basically you're gonna need to set it off someplace, lean it up against a wall or whatever. You wanna keep that in that direction the rest of the time um, well, until that stuff gets somewhat hard, but. Um, for the most part, it's just good practice just to leave it in that position, and then and then you can paint it and put the thing back in. But that'll keep that glass from kind of moving around. That's a, a classic problem for wrinkling the um, the glazing compound. You spend you know you spend a, a good amount of time um, trying to get that nice and smooth um, and looking right, and then if you move that thing around, it 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 boogers up on you and and, uh, and frustrates you. Um, and the, the, the glazing there, we were showing that, doing it by hand. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's how we do it. But on the, on the larger windows, again, we had that, I had that cordless caulk gun that we would fill um, full of glazing compound. And we would, we would um, use it to, to, to put, the, put the glazing on. It just speed things up. But it didn't really work for this article. I'm not going to tell people to go get a cordless caulk gun and, 
and fill it full of glazing compound. But yeah, that's basically the uh, the um, you know the uh, the article and and kind of how you do um, uh, do restoration on the windows. So um, I think it'd probably be a good time to do questions, and I'll maybe try to stop talking and fumbling around here for a little while. And people that have questions, I've got a microphone. So if you want, Ben, that that was hugely interesting. Thank you. I have a question though. For example, in the picture, there's three different panes in that. In my house, I've got nine or 12. As you replace the glass and glaze it and all of that, is there a technique? Can you do all of them at the same time? Or do you need to do one row? Or do you need to do each pane in, in the sash individually? Each, paint, each, each little piece of glass within a sash? Um, usually, you're going you're gonna to put all the, all the glass in. You know, it's going to be laying flat on the table. You're going to put the, the glazing on that, on that glazing rabbit. Um, and you're going to set all the glass in, and you're going to, um, you know, you can, you can push them in. Or if you use that sander trick, that's a good way to, to get them set in. And then, and then use the glazing points. Once the glazing points are in, you know, you can move that sash around, and the glass isn't going to fall out. And then you can, uh, I set it up on an easel. Um, I, I've got this wooden easel that you see in the article, but a, a really good way to make an easel is to, that doesn't that really cost anything, is you can use an A-frame ladder, okay? So if you have an A-frame ladder and you have um, a couple of those quick grip clamps, you can put a board across the A-frame ladder and use those quick grip clamps to clamp the board on, and there you've got, a, you've got an easel. Um, it's just a, that's a, a quick way. We should have shown that in this, in this article, it was just something that I, I didn't. I, we we did we did that out at the building, but we we had made these wooden easels, and we had them, so we thought, well, we'll just use them. But it was dumb because I ended up having to take them out to my house, and that was a big hassle. We could have just thrown up an A-frame ladder, and and it would have been it would have been a lot more relatable to people also. Um, but if you've got like a nine light, you know, so it's let's say it's a three what three over three, okay. Um, you would have those in, and you can, you can then do the same same technique where you glaze. You know, have the thing upside down, glaze the all the tops, turn them, glaze all the sides. Just keep rotating. But again, you want to you want to finish in the in the position that the window's going to be in, just so that they, they're not going to shift around. The smaller lights, they're not they're not going to shift as much um, as maybe maybe some of the bigger ones do. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. More than anything, when you, if you've got like a multi-light, like a nine light, is when you take them out, try to keep them in order. So when they go back in, or yeah, try to keep them in order because they are different. They, they just, they just, they are. Um, and so when, when you're putting that glazing on and you're setting that glass to begin with, you know, where you set it on and you use the sander, a, a really good thing to do before you do that is to make sure that all of them fit in their, in their holes before you put the glazing compound on because inevitably if you don't do that, you'll end up and they won't fit and then you have glazing on them and then, they're, and then you're cleaning that off and you're, and you're trying to score and, and um, break a, a small amount of glass off. Because a, a lot of the times when you, uh, when, you have the, when you have the sash out, sometimes they, they, they kind of have a little bit of racking to them. So a lot of the times what we'll do is we'll, we'll just reclamp them and repin them. We don't, we don't take the old pins out, but we put a new pin in and it'll just tighten. It'll just tighten everything up so that you don't have that, you know, you don't have this loosey goosey um, sash. But by doing that, a lot of times you make things a little bit smaller and then you have to um, do some work to the, uh, to the glass. And that usually is just scoring along the edge and then breaking a small amount off. And then you can, there's a, you can use a belt sander that has an abrasive a sanding um, belt on it that's made for, for glass. That takes off a small amount, but usually you just have to score it. And that's, a, that's not that much fun to do, but um, is what it is. Hi, um, I have a couple questions. Um, my husband and I have been doing our windows. We've done two so far in our house. And I have to say, it, 
we just did it. We just decided to take our time and just figure it out step by step, and we did it. But it was tricky the first one. But this has helped because it's given me some tips that'll help make it go faster and, sure. and easier. But I was wondering, um, for someone who was who wanted to hire someone to redo their windows, uh, what is your estimated cost? What it would cost someone to fix their fix a? I you know I know it can't be specific or exact, but. Just try, I'm, I'm also on the board of preservation, so we deal with people that are wanting to replace their windows and we try and push, you know, fixing them and, um, or having someone fix them and there's always the cost, you know, what does it cost to fix them versus just buy a new one? Yeah, and, that, and that's an issue. Um, you've got uh, replacement, so you've got replacement windows, um, which are really easy to get a, to get a cost estimate from. Um, it's a lot more difficult to get a cost estimate if you can find somebody that will actually do it um, to do restoration. And uh, people are leery, uh, rightfully so, of giving numbers because a lot of the times you don't know, you don't know everything. And you don't know it until you open it up. And then you open it up and oh boy, this is a, this is a real problem. Um, so, you know, I, Trying to think, I, I, I run into this all the time <laughs> because it's um, because I, I get asked, you know, what's what's it going to cost? And it's one of one of the things that has been I've been leery of um, is trying to is trying to figure out costs. You know, you basically you try to break it down into an hourly. So if you figure, you know, if you figure you can do, I don't know, if you can do a sash, if you can do a sash in eight hours. I don't know. I mean, you're going to be doing more than one, um, but it's going to it's going to be um, it's time consuming. That's just all there is to it. And I don't necessarily know that it's it's pro it's probably pretty comparable to the cost of replacement windows. You know, it's of, it's, of a wood replacement window or of a vinyl. Uh, well, it's not going to be or as cheap as a vinyl window is probably, yeah. um, but it's going to be probably pretty comparable to to a wood window. Um, there are advantages to it. Um, one, you're not filling the land full, full of full of windows. Um, uh, two, they're going to be they're going to look historically accurate because they are they are historically accurate, um, and they're repairable. Uh, that's a, a you know a, a big thing to them. Where the replacements, you know, that's the the, the old saying that the restoration people do is, is that replacements are are just exactly that, they're replacements, and you're gonna replace them over and over and over, because the, the thermal pane, that fails, and then you get fogged window, and there's, they're not repairable, so you have to throw them out, and you have to replace them again. Where with the single panes, um, I, I know they're not energy efficient wise, as the, as the doubles are, but when you put a storm on the outside, you get the, you get the efficiency. Um, and there, is, there are some manufacturers now that are making, making a glass that's a thinner, that's that's thermally pain that allows you to do that, um, but you know, I I would guess a, a normal residential, you know, you're probably by the time you get all said and done, you're probably at about eight hours per per window. So then take that times whatever the hourly hourly rate is, um, which I don't know what the going rate I don't know what the going rate in Sioux Falls is, if it's if it's fifty dollars, if it's seventy five dollars, if it's a hundred dollars, I don't I don't know. So it could be four hundred dollars a window, or $500. oh yeah, 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 it could be four hundred dollars a window. We real, just put real in quick. some nice new, um, wood. I mean, top of the line windows in a property we own. Uh, two of them was all we needed to do, but I think it was. I mean, it, they were like seven hundred dollars each, or or yeah. even close. I mean, they were maybe even a thousand each. We got their big windows. We got top of the line. So yeah, you know, and I'm and I'm talking I'm, I'm talking about like like these. Right. You know, these are a, a smaller. You know, and there's you know there's there's a bank of three, so you know that's you know right there. If, if four hundred dollars was the was the estimate, you know you're looking at twelve hundred for that for that bank of, of three, and that's just going to be the that's just going to be the window itself. That's not going to be a storm on the outside. Um, that's going to be an additional cost um, along with it. So it if you do it yourself, it's yeah. If you do it yourself, it's 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 very economically viable. Um, if you're if you're paying somebody else, it's it, there's just no two ways about it. it there's there's a, 
a good amount of labor involved, um, and there's just not a lot of people that are willing to take that on. Um, and so, be, and it, and it, and you got to be, you got to be mobile. You got to be able to go to site. You got to be on site. You got to have your windows out. Uh, they're going to be plywooded up for a period of time. It's it's not a, it's it's not an instantaneous bang bang thing like replacements are. Um, uh, but there's advantages to, to the restoration of it. Um, but I, I'm not I'm not going to be here to try to convince you one direction or another. Basically, I wanted to show like like what it is that what it is that I do, did on that building, what what we did with the magazine article and 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 then you know uh, with that information, then you can make decisions that are educated. So I have a couple questions. One is um, we don't have too many contractors in Sioux Falls that um, offer this kind of work. So I'm wondering if you have ever done, say, um, a hands-on all-day type of workshop where, in our case, with the Board of Preservation, that maybe we could hire you for a day to take a window, say, at somebody like Rachel's house, to show us how to restore <laughs> it and have you know people there to be able to watch, listen, and learn. Um, uh, is that possible? Sure, at, at some point that's that's certainly possible. I know you're really busy. Yeah, that's the, the issue that I've got right now. I just I just built a new shop in Yankton, um, and I've been working on doors. So I, I build I build doors also. Um, so I've got seven uh, quarter sawn white oak doors that I've got for a congregational church in town. That are it's a historic. Um, project beautiful beautiful church they're renovating um, uh, took all the stained glass out but, but my job is the is the doors and um, and I need to get them done because um, they <laughs> so maybe we could schedule you for next summer or yeah spring maybe, or something. yeah sure so, sure okay. um, and then and then like I said I've, I've got another article with fine home building um, that's going to be on on storm windows so hopefully we can get that get that done I'm kind of in the same boat with them where they've been asking when can we come out and and I I, I answered about the, as well as I answer it here <laughs> and for everybody here um, we are videotaping so we'll have that on the SiouxFalls.org uh, website on Board of Preservation so you'll have access to that as well as those videos that Ben showed us today too my other question is regarding the Mead building how many windows were on that, and how long did it take you to re repair or replace all of those? I think there's about 230, there's 230, 240 windows. Um, and they're not all complete, they're not all done yet. Um, they've all been, the storm windows have been made for everything. Um, there were, there was questions as far as some of the windows and whether or not, some of them were just are shot. Um, there's a there's a back side of the building that's a north side that's inside. Uh, there's two wings that go back, and there's going to be there's a bunch of windows on that wall, but a, a number of those windows are being filled in. There's an elevator that's going up there, um, and it's a north facing, never gets sun, is always in shadow, um, and had and there's a flat roof that's up above it. Um, I think. What they've decided to do with some of those is to do, and also the, the windows are completely rotted out. I mean, casement, window, everything, it's just gone. There's just nothing but a hole in the, in the stonework. Um, and so they've decided to do um, replacements there instead of, instead of rebuilding. Um, and I think they're going with, um, I think, I th I think they're a, a metal clad with wood on the on the interior. I believe is the case. It, it just has to do with it with their location on the building. It's on the back side of the building, um, but it like I said, it doesn't receive any sun, and there's been moisture issues back there. Um, it's going to be there's going to be an elevator there, so there's a number of those windows that that are are not going to be done. 